بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith In our previous episode we discussed the concept of Tawheed al-Rububiyya or the unity of Allah's Lordship and we also discussed the categories of Tawheed al-Rububiyya Today we're going to talk about the proofs of Tawheed al-Rububiyya or if you like the proofs for the existence of a God. We hope you'll stay tuned with us today and learn some important facts and information about this concept. <laughs> Welcome back. Today's topic is about the proofs of Tawheed al-Rububiyya, or if you like, the proofs of the existence of God. Now this topic is one which has stimulated a lot of talk, a lot of theories and a lot of maxims throughout the history of mankind. Many are the philosophers and many are the religions that have tried to discuss this topic. How do we know that a God exists? How do we know that there is a Rabb of this world? And there are thousands, literally thousands of theories, of maxims, of philosophical discussions from the earliest philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, to later on philosophers of the Judeo Christian tradition, to even the Muslim philosophers as well. They have tried to discuss this concept. Yet if you look at the Qur'an, and this is something very amazing, you find that this topic, how to prove a God exists, is hardly mentioned at all. Just a few ayat, few verses in the Qur'an. You can literally count the number of verses that are addressed to atheists, to those who deny God. You can count them on the fingers of one hand. This is because the acknowledgement that there is a Rabb, that there is a Creator, is something which every single person has ingrained inside of him. So today we're going to discuss the few Qur'anic ayat and the few Qur'anic proofs that are used to show the rububiyya, to show the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first creation or the first uh, evidence of a creator, of a Rabb, is the creation itself. The fact that we exist and that there is the earth and the sun and the moon and all that is around us the creation itself is the biggest sign that there must be a creator. This is because every object of existence must have a creator. It cannot just come out of nothing. There must be something that made it, that placed it there. There is a very interesting narration in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari where a person by the name of Jubayd ibn Mut'im, who was at that time a non-Muslim, he went to the Prophet wasallam in Medina. And he was not a Muslim at this time. And he entered the mosque while the Prophet ﷺ was praying. And he was reciting Surah At-Tur, verse 35. This verse translates as, Am min Were they created out of nothing? Or did they create themselves? The Prophet ﷺ recited this verse in the prayer. Jubayr narrates that at that time, I was a mushrik, I was a pagan. When I heard this verse, I felt my heart soar up into the skies, fly up. It was so powerful, so emphatic. Where did you come from? Were you created out of nothing or did you create yourselves? There must be a creator that created you. So Jubayr said, that is when Iman entered my heart. When this question Allah asks in the Quran, where did you come from? You have three options. Either you were created out of nothing or you created yourselves or there is an all-powerful, almighty Rabb who created you. So Allah asks the rhetorical question, were you created out of nothing? Or did you create yourselves? And he doesn't ask the third because that is the answer. Or did Allah create you? Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, in Surah Al-Luqman verse 11, He says, هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ This is the creation of Allah all around you. This is the creation, look around you. فَأَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ دُونِهِ Show me, what have those besides him created? What have they these idols and these objects of worship created nothing. This is the creation of Allah. So show me what those that are worshipped besides Allah have created. They cannot create anything. And yet another verse which proves this, Surah Al-Hajj verse 73, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those whom you worship besides Allah, they will never be able to create a fly, a mosquito. They would never be able to create a fly even if they all joined forces together. 
If all of these false gods and false deities, everything of the creation joined together, they could not create a single fly. The smallest and the most weakest of the creation. And then Allah says, if this fly were to take something from them, they would not be able to retrieve what the fly took. That's how weak they are. That's how weak the creation is. This verse is so powerful. And now modern science has, has come and shown us yet another beauty of this verse. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if this fly were to come take something, suppose you have some food here, a piece of bread, the fly comes and lands on the bread. Modern science has now shown that the digestion of the fly starts outside of the stomach. As soon as... It, it, the fly spits out some saliva which is digestive in nature. And the food begins to be digested immediately upon contact. And then the fly takes in this digested food into its system. Can the greatest scientists of the world come and when this fly takes a little bit of their food, can they bring that food back from the fly? They cannot do so. This is the Rabb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, you cannot even create a fly. You can't even take back what a fly takes from you. This is how weak you are, how powerless you are. So this is the first proof of the fact that Arab exists. The harmony, the majesty of the creation, how everything fits together, interlocks into place. This is the first and the greatest proof that there is a Rabb that takes care of us. In a verse which even further emphasizes this point, in Surah Al-Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is the one who has created the seven heavens in layers. الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت You do not see in the creation of Allah the slightest flaw, the slightest inconsistency. فرجع البصر Look again. هل ترى من فطور Do you see any defect? Do you see anything out of place? It shouldn't be there. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ثم رجع البصر Look again. كرتين Over and over. Continually look, continually examine. Look at the creation around you, the sun, the moon, the stars. Look at science, biology, physics, chemistry. Look at how everything interlocks and fits into place. Do you find the slightest inconsistency, the slightest flaw? It should have been this way, it should have been that way. Nothing. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will continue to look until your eyesight comes back humbled while it is fatigued. You will become tired trying to examine the creation of Allah to find a fault, but you will not find a fault. And this is the greatest evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and He is our creator and our Rabb. Yet another evidence is the evidence of the ayat or the signs of the creation. Now this can also be considered a subcategory of the first, which is the creation in its entirety. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions certain aspects and certain creations which are more powerful more majestic. How many of us, when we witness a sunset, suppose we're standing next to the sea and we witness the sunset, the power and the beauty that, is, that we feel, it is not just like looking at any other part of the creation. It's not, for example, as majestic as a tree or an apple, for example. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses some aspects of the creation and He calls them miracles, ayat, even though the entire creation is a miracle. Of these is, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Verse 164, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the changing of the day and night and in the ships that sail through the ocean and, which, and, the, uh, and the rain that comes down from the skies thereby giving life, sprouting forth fruit and the movement of every creature and the directing of the winds and the clouds these are signs, ayat, for people who think about them. So this is yet another, cre another evidence, another proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists because there are certain signs which are so powerful. The fact that you walk out into a moonless night and you see the stars above you, you feel how small and insignificant you are. And you realize that there must have been and there is a Rabb who has created it, who has put it in its place and who has created us and our purpose of existence. Yet another evidence and proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to prove his existence is the proof of the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took with Adam alayhi salam. When Adam alayhi salam was created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him in Arafat, the place that we go to for Hajj. And there he extracted from Adam 
all of Adam's children that would arise until the day of judgment, including us, including our forefathers and our children to be. All of us were there, our souls were there. And he then spoke to us, all of mankind, the entire creation. And he asked them, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Qalu bala, they said, yes, you are our Lord. And this is in the Quran. This is in the Quran. This is Surah, one, uh, surah Al-A'raf, verse 172, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ Mention when your Lord took from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants. He took them out from Adam. And he spread them before him. And he made them testify against themselves. قالوا, قال ألست بربكم? قالوا بلا. He asked them, am I not your Lord? They said, yes you are. And there's also a narration which further proves this point. Regarding this ayah, the Prophet ﷺ explained this ayah. So we'll take a short break inshallah and we'll come back and we'll look up this ayah from its source book. See you soon inshallah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll discuss some, some tips on, on how to increase the, the ability of getting the du'a or the supplication answered. Allah delays giving you what you want and gives you a reward that is equal to that or better in this life or in the world to come uh, for giving you your sins and giving you good deeds. I'm going to look at some questions that we've asked some of our brothers on the street. Uh, we asked them, should Muslims have a dialogue with other religions? We're going to need some stability. So. We, uh, it doesn't matter where we live, we need to care for those ones to give them the rights that Allah gives. This life is not the eternal life, it is a test. Particularly for the youth of today. So if there are any parents or uncles or whoever is watching, if you have 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds with you, make sure they stop doing whatever they're doing and come in and watch this show, inshallah. <laughs> back. Uh, we were discussing uh, the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took with Adam alayhi salam and the progeny of Adam at the time of the creation and we're going to now discuss a tradition which talks about this covenant in further detail. Akhi, if you can hand me volume 3 of the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. Uh, the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim is a book written by Muhammad ibn Abdullah Al-Hakim and Naysapuri who died in the year 405 Hijrah. What he wanted to do was to take the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim for an authentic hadith and find the other hadith which they did not include in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And that is why he called it Al-Mustadrak which means like an appendix. He added on something to Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith which met the criterion of Bukhari and Muslim. However, because he passed away before he could critically edit the work, there are still uh, some weak narrations in the book. So therefore it is not to the level of Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, the narration we want to look at is reported by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that Allah jalla jalaluhu took the covenant, the mithaq, in Arabic it's called mithaq, the covenant, from Adam alayhi salam while he was at Arafah. And he extracted from Adam, from the loins of Adam, all of the progeny of Adam. And he spread them out in front of him. And he then spoke to them face to face, kallamahum qubula. And he asked them, alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? So they responded, yes, you are our Lord. So that on the day of judgment, they would not have an excuse. Likewise, in the next tr tradition in this book, Umar ibn al-Khattab narrates that the Prophet ﷺ was asked about this very ayah, the same verse. And he said that, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said that, Allah rubbed the back of Adam. And by that, he extracted all of the children of Adam until the day of judgment. And the hadith goes on. The point is that this is, the, the aspect of the mithaq or the contract, the covenant, it is explicitly narrated in the Qur'an and in the sunnah. So this mithaq or this covenant, Allah placed it in the soul of every single human being, Muslim and kafir. And this is known as the fitrah or the human nature, innate human nature. Every person automatically he has some idea of what is good and what is bad. For example, everybody knows that 
stealing, lying, cheating is bad. Everybody knows that being good to your parents, being nice to relatives is good. Where did this come from? It is something which is in all cultures, in all societies. This is part of the fitrah or the human nature. And of the fitrah, of the human nature, is that Allah exists. And that He is the only one who is worthy of our worship. This fitrah is referred to also in many hadith. Of them is the hadith in Sahih Muslim, in which the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that I have created all of my servants pure and inclined towards the fitrah, pure and inclined towards the worship of Allah. But then shayateen came to them and they tried to divert them from my worship and they made them associate partners with me. In yet another tradition, the Prophet ﷺ said that every single child is born upon the fitrah. He said this, that every single child, whether he's born to Muslim parents, to Christian parents, to Jewish parents, whatever the religion might be, he is born innately upon the human nature called the fitrah. And then his parents change him into a Christian or a Jew or whatever. So what this means is that every single person, when he is born, he automatically, and as soon as he becomes old enough to think, he automatically knows that there is a creator and that there is only one creator as well. And he knows that he should worship this creator. This is the fitrah or the human nature. He knows the basics of good from the basics of bad. And if such a person were left without any interfering factors, if a child were left without the pressures of society and culture and religion of his parents and surroundings, then he would grow up knowing that there is God and only one God. But the problem arises because of the influence of parents, of society, of culture, of the other religions. Therefore, the pure fitrah is then corrupted. The pure fitrah is then corrupted and the child grows up to be a believer of another religion. For example, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was born obviously before the wahi or the inspiration came down. For 40 years, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not a prophet. He became a prophet after that. The inspiration started after he was 40 years old. But did he do any wrong, even in these 40 years? Did he worship other idols? No, he didn't. Why? Because he was upon the fitrah. He was upon the pure fitrah of Islam. He knew right from wrong. And of that right and wrong was that these idols are not worthy of worship. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of worship. So this is the pure fitrah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his fitrah was not corrupted by society and culture. Because he was upon the pure fitrah, he grew up worshipping Allah alone. Yes, he didn't know the details of fasting, the details of prayer, the details of iman. He didn't know the details. That would come with inspiration. But he did know that Allah is my creator and that these objects are not worthy of my worship. Therefore, it is not permissible for me to worship these statues and these stones. And because he was upon the fitrah, he left the worship of these idols and he worshipped Allah alone, even though the inspiration had not started upon him. So this is yet another proof of the existence of a Rabb. Yet another proof, if you want, this is the fourth proof that we have discussed today, is the feeling of helplessness that every single human being feels when he's in a situation of difficulty and hardship. That innate feeling that you call out to someone above you, Oh God, help me. Oh God, save me. It's a feeling which every one of us has, even those who deny that Allah exists. When they are in a situation of life and death, or one of their loved ones is in a situation of life and death, then immediately the heart, please, the heart just cries out, Oh God, do something. Where did this cry come from? You, the same person who says you don't believe in a God, why, when you need him, do you call out to him? And Allah mentions this explicitly in the Quran in many, many verses. Of them, Surah Yunus, verse 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when any distress touches mankind, when any distress happens to him, he begins to call out to us. Standing, sitting and lying down, day and night. Whatever situation he's in, he'll say, Ya Rabb, help me, save me, cure my son, do this and that. And as soon as we respond to him, he pretends as if he was never calling out to us in the first place. Forgets everything. And this is the way man is. This is the way man is. But the fact that he calls out, the fact that he automatically, intrinsic, he doesn't even think about it. His soul just says, oh God, do something. This is a proof 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that he is the Rabb. And there is a story of a, f uh, a friend of mine, I knew him, he was uh, a sailor. He was a sailor and he wasn't a Muslim. And he said, he told me this himself, I heard this story myself, he said that, I never believed in God. Throughout my life I was growing up and I was never a religious person. And I used to go out to the ocean a lot. One day a storm overtook me. And it was raining and pouring and the waves were coming. And it was complete darkness in the middle of the night and I was all alone. All of a sudden I cried out, Oh God, save me. And then I thought, but I don't even believe in a God. He didn't even realize, he said, Oh God, save me. And he said, then he thought, after he said that, he said, but I don't even believe in a God. Why am I calling out to him? And then he was saved and he came back uh, onto the shore. And he continued to live his life as if nothing happened. One day a Muslim gave him a copy of the Quran. And just flicking through it, he read certain verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this very situation. Allah says when they ride the oceans, and it is raining and, and there's a storm going on, they call out to Allah, Oh Allah, if you save us from this, we will be of the ones who are thankful. And when Allah saves them, they return to their old ways. When he read this, he said, my body started shaking. He said, this described me exactly. This was me. When I needed God, I called out to Him. And as soon as I was saved, I forgot all about Him. And he also said one thing, very beautiful. He said the descriptions I read of this storm, this tempest, it could only have been written by a sailor. And when I found out that the Prophet Muhammad had never written on a boat in his whole life, I knew then that this was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The descriptions of the storm and the wave and the, the wind and the rain coming down, he said this can only be written by a sailor. Then when he discovered that the Prophet lived in the desert, he never rode a ship in his life then he knew this must be from Allah, so he accepted Islam. So the fact that there is an intrinsic plea out to Allah shows you that He exists and He is the Creator. Yet another proof is the proof of the sending of the Prophets and the Messengers. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Messengers and these Messengers come with a perfect system of laws, a perfect belief, a perfect code, and that they are supported with miraculous signs. The Prophet ﷺ, the moon split in half. Can anybody do that? Prophet Musa, he threw the staff and it became a serpent, eating up the other serpents. Isa alayhi salam, he raised the dead. He made them alive again by the permission of Allah. This is yet another proof of the existence of a Rabb, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that the Quranic proofs are few, but they are strong and powerful. The, the creation itself, and the signs of the creation, and the fact of the mithaq or the covenant that Allah took from Adam and it is inside every one of us, and the feeling of helplessness that we get, we need a creator. And also the sending of the prophets and the books, these are some of the evidences that the Qur'an use, uses to prove that there is an all-powerful, almighty Rabb, and this is the evidences of Tawheed al rububiyyah uh, If there are any questions regarding this topic, we'll take them now, inshallah. Yes, go ahead. We study many different theories at university and schools in the West, which attempt to prove the existence of a creator. What does Islam have to say about these? Okay, this is a good uh, point because, because there are many theories that philosophers have devised trying to prove that there is a God or a creator. But you find though that these theories, most of them are extremely complicated. If you go back to Aristotle, he's talking about substances and accidents. You go back to Oxum's Razor, Pascal's Wager. These are various theories that they have invented. It takes like a PhD in, in, in philosophy just to understand them in the first place. Whereas if you look at the Quranic evidences, you find them to be simple, to the point. Everybody can understand these evidences. So these theories, in reality, they don't prove much. And they go about proving it in a very, very complicated way. And they only prove, if they do prove anything, they prove that there is a God. But you need after this, the Quran. You need after this, the wahi or the inspiration from Allah to tell you what to do based upon that. So these proofs, we don't need them. They're too complicated, they involve complex logic, intricate theories, too difficult. You're not going to go to the average person who doesn't know anything about philosophy and try to prove in this manner. But if you use these evidences that I have presented to you, the Qur'anic evidences, then the most ignorant person to the most highest intellectual, he can understand it, it is crystal clear, he can believe in it, and based upon that he can then start his journey towards the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This brings us to the conclusion of our talk for today. We hope to see you soon. Till next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.